computer specialist Fred Dignazio is our guest on For Your Information. Questioning Mr. Dignazio for 11 Together is Ben Stone. Do you remember when computers used to look like this? That was only 25 years ago or so. They don't look like that anymore, and because they don't, all kinds of new things are, are possible. And that's the subject we're going to talk about today with my guests, Fred Dignazio and Bruce Mitchell, who's an educational programmer. And there are really, we really ought to say more than, than, than two guests. We have a lot of guests here, and they, uh, as you know, they give me the creeps a little bit. Computers uh, scare me. I come from, I guess, the pre-computer generation, just slightly this side of of the computer world. Fred, what has happened to, to allow this burgeoning of, of development? Well, ben, uh, maybe I can reach over here now and ask you to show while I speak about it. But I don't what, know if our camera can see that. Which, which camera what, are we going to What Ben is holding there for here? is, uh, and we've got a screen too, perhaps we can show the magnified version, but computers have now reduced to a cornflake size or ladybug sized brain, and the uh, same goes for computer memory. And this miniaturization of electronic circuits has produced an ability to take, just like Alice in Wonderland, uh, who shrank and entered a new world. Well, computers now, by shrinking down, can be installed in almost any appliance around our home, in our workplace, or wherever. This is the computer chip. This is the latest generation of computer chip? This new chip is about the most powerful thing going, and that single chip can duplicate the functions of the entire room size computer you were just showing. Now we've got a larger picture of the circuitry that's on this chip. If, pull back and, and show, if you can, just how many intricacies there are on this tiny thing, which is a quarter of an inch by a quarter of an inch, something like that? Right, that's right. You, what you have now is the ability using something like an electron beam to create a thin circuit that is so tiny that it's many times thinner than the width of a human hair. Now, what, is, what does this development allow the industry to do? What's possible now with computers? What we see, Ben, is a complete change in focus of, of the computer. Once in the past, we had the computer as the reserve of uh, large institutions, governments and corporations and so forth. Now we have the ability of the computer to go more places. It's so cheap that you can pack a lot of computer power in almost any appliance or device that you can imagine. And as a result, you're, we're able, through new technologies, to create computers that have voices, computers with music, computers with colorful pictures. And then it's up to really the individual or the organization, the type of application they can dream up with any particular kind of computer. There are computers that run devices that do actual physical movement and work robots in fact right that's right we have what's called in fact the robot revolution the 80s are called the the uh, the decade of the robot and we have in fact robots in factories uh, thousands and thousands of them here in the United States and in Japan and in Western Europe that are taking over some of the tedious and dangerous jobs that uh, used to be done by human beings the image of for the older ones of us Robbie the robot and the younger ones R2, R2D2 Robots running around uh, with twirling lights and flashing eyes, talking back to the boss. Is that what's going on in robotics now? Well, again, you have this phenomenon where you can create and mold the type of shape of robot that you want. In industry, it's quite different. There, it, it's been described as like a fire hydrant with a giraffe neck and head uh, hanging around. It's a single large robotic arm with a manipulator or a hand on the end that actually is used to weld, for example, uh, parts of a car's body. Now, those are actually in use right now, and I think that we have some pictures, uh, some video that, that shows just what we're talking about in, in the factory. Yes, right. What we have is uh, showing today is a large, what's called Unimate robot that's being employed in this case to the robot arm you can see in the picture holding a welding gun. Here, another robot arm is picking up and using a piece, a machine part, and uh, from a, a, a vat of toxic liquid, and there you have another arm telescoping out to pick up a part. And you can see these are robots that are used in a, the automotive industry. So robots can be used to handle the difficult and, and very dangerous jobs that, that men have to do right now. It's ironic, in fact. Uh, automation used to be seen as a bugaboo that, for example, organized labor might uh, launch a counterattack to and oppose. But many uh, members, for example, of the UAW are in favor of 
a certain degree of automation because the types of jobs that the robots are taking over are very undesirable jobs to start with. What about application of robotics for the home computer? I mean, now we're getting into a, uh, an age where you and I can go out and buy little computers to the, the early ads uh, told us that we could use them to balance our checkbooks and to plan our meals and so on, but we're a lot more, uh, f a lot further advanced now. We can do a lot more with home computers, can't we? Right. What we have now, Ben, is a new ability to program the home computers using some of the new facilities. For example, if you have a computer that has uh, a robot attached, then you can actually write a robot programming language. If you have a computer that plays music, then you can write uh, actually play on the score, uh, play a score on the, the screen so you can actually type in and put in the notes of the music that you want to have the computer play. So even programming has changed a good deal from the uh, old idea where you just used words and letters and created uh, uh, complicated numerical functions. So with a home computer you can actually compose music, and play it back? Right. In can fact, you show us? In fact we have a computer here today it's the Apple computer, basically, and a company in Raleigh, I call them the Technological Wizards, it's uh, Microtechnology Unlimited, puts a tiny circuit board that you plug right in the back of the standard home computer Apple. And that board stores actual songs in this memory here, a floppy disk memory. And then when I press this button, then the tiny bits and bytes of electricity will, are going to be translated into musical notes on the speaker. And so right, what is happening now, the computer is composing the music and shooting it out to the speaker. This, by the way, is called Root Beer Rag. <laughs> what instrument is playing it back? OK, what the computer is doing, it is trying to imitate, in some cases, and other times it's just doing totally synthetic instruments. Uh, at times, I think what it's trying to imitate is a piano. Every, every instrument has its characteristic waveform. And a small computer tries its best with its particular memory and speed to duplicate that waveform. And it's so fast, it can shoot notes out one at a time. Even a very fast tempo pace, like a ragtime music, even sounds pretty good. It really does. Now, this can be done, this can be done at home by anyone with this, with this addition to home computer music. Right. What you have is, uh, first, a board like this that you can install on your computer for about $70. And then there are computers that come intact with a musical ability. And one of these, I just show the, the booklet here. Here, this will make you a programmer. If we can zero in on this, um, here we go. Over here, okay. If we can zero in, this is an Atari music composer. And as you can see right, right here, that's what the screen would look like on the Atari. Mm. As you put in, entered the notes of music, and you can play arranger as well as composer and arrange as many as four voices at the same time. So you have a pretty wide ability to compose and arrange your own music. And then just push the play button and the song will play for you on, over the computer speaker. Bruce, you're a, uh, an educational programmer. That sounds a very impressive title and, and I'm wondering what application computers have in early education, middle education. How are, how are these devices used? OK, uh, first you have to divide the educational area into two groups. There's the group where you're using the computer as a means of drilling the student. And I, drilling uh, not in the sense that you're going to be standing there with a little plunger pushing it into their head, but more, more along uh, lines where the child interacts with the computer and learns concepts maybe mathematical concepts, mm -hmm. for instance. Uh, then you have the area which the child will reach it uh, somewhere in the fourth or fifth grade where they can actually start programming the computers. Well, there's a combination, obviously, from there on through college level where they can use the computer for computer-aided instruction and also use the computer to develop their own programs, whatever they may be. It, gives them the opportunity for the first time to really be creative. Uh, now, uh, what you like to do with the younger children is attempt to create languages or whatever that they can start very, very early. Uh, one of the things that we've done, and we use it in the preschool, uh, we have recently uh, acquired the services of the turtle, the terrapin turtle, which is a little robo robot that runs around on the floor 
and draws pictures. Well, the first program that we had was purely a joystick program where the child would use the joystick pos to position or give the turtle directionality. Mm -hmm. And this is real good for uh, eye-hand coordination things, directionality development. Then, uh, more recently, uh, there's a program on in the computer now that uh, we'll let you show in a second that actually introduces the child to a kind of a primitive form of programming. It is kind of, you almost have to call it turtle graphics. It's an ability for the programmer to actually tell the turtle what to do. It will show the student what he's told the turtle to do. Then he can actually have the turtle execute this on the floor and draw out the, the diagram. It may not look much like a turtle, but that's the turtle <laughs> we're talking about. Now, I'm going to uh, I'm going to program this, and it's fitting that you should have chosen a, a most primitive program. I'm a most primitive <laughs> programmer. You're going to have to tell me every step of the way. I have a uh, is an Atari uh, keyboard here, right? Ready for my uh, less than nimble fingers. Now, what we have is that you can press uh, press one of the letter keys to start with. Q. Okay. For question. Now, if the, uh, on the computer you'll see that there's an X on the screen mm -hmm. and that's the current position of the turtle okay. where he's sitting on the floor. Okay, now uh, in order to have the turtle move forward you would press the up arrow key and you can press that, uh, let's Several say, times? yes, press it say five or six times. And, and you're actually programming right. it, right? You're not okay. actually now, instructing it but you're creating right. a program. You're okay. actually creating a program that you'll execute in a few moments. All right. Uh, now, if you press the, uh, uh, how about if I press the, the, the back one? Okay. Will it turn right back around and then press the forward one again? Okay. Now and then press <laughs> the. Then now, now tell it to go uh, left. Okay, left twice. Oh, that's right. gonna no, that's going to get too yeah. far. That's going to get him off the paper. Off the He's paper. How do I erase? Uh, that's erase been, this. This hasn't been added to the program yet. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. But he'll he'll draw on your floor, but I think we can probably get it up. Okay. Okay. Then you might want to press the down arrow, which will bring him back, kind of bring him back towards his home. Okay. okay. And if you go a little bit further back than uh, he is, one one more arrow, down arrow. Okay. okay. Now, if you Turn give down. him the right arrow. No, I think now. The right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Give him a couple of those, and that'll bring him back out onto the paper. Okay. okay. We hope. Yes. Okay. Now, <laughs> it's a strange pattern that he's going to be running, and now let's see if it actually works. <laughs> For, yeah, do I have I to push enter or anything? Or? Just the space Just bar. Just the space bar. bar. Are we ready? Let's have a little turtle music. Okay. Can we play a little turtle actually, music? he's going to look squeaking. Oh. Here we go. Up, up. There he goes. Winding around on uh -oh. himself. Oh no! He's <laughs> he's oh gonna, my goodness! He's gonna trip. <laughs> Turtle running amok. <laughs> <laughs> there are some problems. The turtle. What you have, Ben, is you have bugs in your program. <laughs> Thanks to your programmers here, Bruce and me. I right. see. Okay. Well, it, it is programmable right. by someone with a bit more uh, <laughs> sense than this one. Well, the kids, what's phenomenal is, is that um, I have a five-year-old, and I took home a similar robot toy called the Big Track. It, it, I don't know if you can, if it's sitting down there now, you might shoot a camera at it. Mm -hmm. And this Big Track has its computer right on board, under the keyboard, and it's a little robot tank. And I'm sitting there with this, about 30 pages of instructions, and I'm wading through them very haltingly. And meanwhile, my five-year-old is already pressing the keyboard and programming the big track robot um, tank to go ahead and do its moves way ahead of me. So that there is, it, it is possible for children and young people to feel towards computers the way we feel towards a pogo stick or a bicycle. It's I, just a, an organic yeah. part of life almost. I think what, what happens is, is that we didn't have the benefit of learning computers just as if we'd learned a second language like mm -hmm. English. And what children seem to have is just this fascination and affinity for electronic devices like computers, and they don't have our stumbling blocks. So they move very quickly to learning how computers work. How can the average uh, less than adept at electronics citizen 
like myself, get into the world of home computers and not be swamped by mathematics and physics and logic and all of that? Well, we recommend that uh, the person just starting should acquire one of the computers that's just a step uh, removed from the video game. The video game has, it's almost still a black box computer that you take a cartridge and just apply that solid state cartridge and immediately your program is up and running. Mm -hmm. And the new, what I call wizard computers, like the, the Apple that we have here today, the Atari, and there's a new computer coming out called the VIC-20. And these computers are low priced, so you're, not, you're spending less than you would on a color television. And in addition to that, you have the ability to either put in the cartridge and just be up and running with Star Wars or something, Star Wars or something like that, or you can program the computer. Mm. And then I think if you have children especially, you just need to turn them loose on some of these programs, and within a couple days you realize that it was a good investment. Where's it all going? We've got a strange little brown box. It's not a black box in front of me. Uh, it looks more, almost like the innards of a time bomb. That's the closest thing, it, it, very sinister looking. Uh, I'm going to take off my microphone here so you can hear what this thing will do. Uh, it looks homemade. Yes, right. It's a chipset and it's a solid state talking chip synthesizer that will actually produce from little bits and bytes of electricity, will actually create a human voice. All right, that's what they're telling us, and here's what that human voice synthesized sounds like. Select cooking time. Select temperature. The number you have reached has been changed. Good morning. The brake fluid is low. There are all kinds of applications then for, for a device like this. How does it work? Basically, there are two methods. One, pioneered uh, and used extensively by Texas Instruments in its speak and spell type toys, actually creates the voice artificially from little bits of data and then puts it out through a speaker. A second method is used in this little chip, which is produced by National Semiconductor. It's called the DigiTalker. And there a human, a man, a woman, or a child can speak into a microphone and record a message. That information is then broken down into little bits of electricity and stored and compressed very, very to small degree. And then later when you press the button on the keyboard, then it takes that particular sequence of little bits of electricity and translates them back into a human voice. I think the, the thing that uh, I like best about this is that it's possible to garble it. It's almost possible to do guerrilla warfare on the computer, especially if you're feeling hostile. Uh, so it sounds like this. I love it. <laughs> it makes human beings feel superior to be able to, to mess this thing up, but it doesn't really mess up too badly. Now, it's doing pretty well because it's operating at thousandths of a second. And probably our circuits here, um, since we did put this box together homemade, are probably not up to industrial standards. But I think one thing that people should realize is that it's best if you get a programmable computer in your home if you have the chance because we're going to see almost every home appliance, whether it's your microwave oven, your dishwasher, your washing machine, your television set, is in the future going to be sold with a little talking chip um, mm. enclosed in it. And when we start seeing these devices or hearing these devices talk to us, there's going to be a strong impression that there is this other creature there, some like, something like a gremlin living inside of your, of your appliance. And unless you and your children realize that, in fact, how this, in fact, works, it's easy to get a lot of misconceptions. And, in fact, it's called high-tech anxiety with people being snowballed by all of these electronic appliances coming into their home. Like and, HAL in 2001. Well, that's right. Yeah. And people develop such a fear and antagonism that they've actually what they call murdered computers, where they've uh, taken like a sledgehammer and uh, smashed it into their computer. I can understand the feeling. And, right. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a frustration that's born, in fact, by just that they are taking over our lives and we don't know what they're doing. And so I know for us adults it's kind of hard to say this because we're late in the game, but I do recommend that we try to get our kids an early start. What about literature? I think that's a loaded question for you because that's what, kind of what you guys have been working on, isn't it? Right. Um, well, in, in my books and in our work in, class, in the classroom situation, too, we are uh, collaborating, Bruce and I, on a series of programs. It's always been this impression that computers are uh, only for the gifted and talented and for older students 
ever, adults even, though I'm not sure adults would deny that. But what we're finding now is that even the very youngest kids, um, even toddlers, can learn how to say program of one of these robots. And so Bruce and I are collaborating on a set of programs that would be used in a preschool environment, in a, then an elementary school environment, and then a second book that would be used in a high school. And uh, so we're testing these programs in different schools in North Carolina. You've got a copy of the latest book? Right. We've got, uh, well, there are three books here, but the two coming out this spring are for, um, say, young people who are of uh, fifth grade and on up. And the first book you see there, published by Doubleday, is a book of projects that once a home computer is brought into the home, um, the young person, after playing Star Wars 45 times in a row, might say, now what's this machine good for? And what I try to do is show, by teaching some of the basics about computers, how, in fact, each of these uh, music synthesis, so you can compose your music, um, how you can draw graphics pictures, how you can make money with a computer, and how, for example, if you have a handicapped friend, uh, this is a wonderful area where computers are now helping people who have um, certain handicaps in seeing or hearing can make use of computers and allows them to better communicate with the world. And this next one. The other book is a speculative book. It takes all kinds of computers, from digital watch computers to uh, robots and so forth, and says, this is what their technology is today, and look how fast it's going ahead. And only 10 years from now, we'll have uh, intelligent houses, we'll have uh, robots, butlers, and maids. And it tries to explain some of the reasons, both good and bad, that we should, again, learn about computers so that we have better control over them. Is there a danger that? Uh computer technology, not necessarily that computers will take over our lives, but that that uh, maybe those who program computers can program them to so that all computers will suddenly take over one day and thrust us all out of jobs and homes and food and all of it. Well, there are two, two um, three really very interesting stories. First off is that you have a proliferation of millions of these small computers. So no longer do you have the phenomenon of this one 1984 style big brother. Now you're going to have millions of big brothers and little sisters and little brothers. The, the young kids, the toddlers, are going to know they become the whizzes at computers. Mm -hmm. And they're doing things, for example, like entering uh, McDonald's um, drawing contests. They did this, the Cal Cal Caltech students in Southern California and they won a Datsun car and a year's supply of groceries by sending a million entries generated by a computer <laughs> into the McDonald's drawing. And another phenomenon you have is what's called artificial intelligence. And it used to be thought that this was just a laboratory thing, but now I notice in Ven Venture Magazine, there are the new artificial intelligence entrepreneurs mm. that are starting business with robots and artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is what? Is, is basically an attempt by human beings to imitate, cause a machine to imitate some intelligent action on the part of a human, whether it's solving a math problem or speaking language so that in the way we as humans are accustomed to it as opposed to sometimes tedious way that you have to communicate with a normal machine. And you create, for example, before we get to the stage of real intelligent computers, we're getting to the stage of an illusion of intelligence, where you have some computer that talks to you, it's very fast, it may even be a robot. Sounds like some bosses I know. <laughs> <laughs> and it sounds, the, the problem is, is that there are these psychoanalysis programs. There's one famous one called ELIZA. And even educated computer scientists fall for the program because the, it asks the most intimate questions of you. And this particular uh, Soviet computer scientist one time in front of all his colleagues sat down at the computer and Eliza said, how are you feeling? And he, he very sincerely typed in how he felt. Well, how's the wife and kids? How's your home life? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and very quickly he started talking to the computer and revealing some very intimate facts about himself. And so again, I think the idea is it's very important for us to know what in fact is taking place inside this computer because very soon computers are going to look very similar to human beings and it'll be hard for us to tell the difference. Aren't there uh, some cases where computers can be even more human than human beings, at least in, their, in, in the projected warmth? Yeah, let me, that's a good point. I'm really glad you mentioned that. Again, the idea that computers are just for the smart above average kid, I think it should be changed to the point where computers are probably best used for someone who's an underachiever, someone who has some sort of a phys physical handicap or a learning disability. And this child then can interact with the computer 
and it has infinite patience. Mm -hmm. The computer never chastises the, the child. He never feels threatened. Secondly, he, he or she can go at his or her own pace in learning. So the, and the computer can be programmed to be what's called a friendly computer. There's no need for it to slap your hand if you get the wrong answer. So a whole new style of learning has taken place where right and wrong are not as important as just gradually working with the child on a step-by-step -step basis on mastering some concept or acquiring some new information. Bruce, when you use the computer in the classroom, do you find that children react the same way towards these devices that uh, I do with a bit of hostility, or, or are children really open for it? Well, what we have found is that the children uh, treat the computer probably better than they treat themselves. They are very, very careful. They make sure that they, well, they will not do anything that they haven't been told they can do. Uh, they have a tremendous amount of respect for the machine. At the same time, they have no fears of it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the greatest thing because most adults uh, in our society will actually suffer great, to a great de degree of just pure fear from the contact with the machine, for, at least for the first few times. Uh, and we find that doesn't exist in children. And it really doesn't seem to start existing until probably high school or older, until you start having knowing of things that you're not supposed to do, really becomes evident. And I, I guess until they start fearing the computer. And at that point, then there's a lot of uh, uh, hidden inhibitions about touching the machine and that it's going to bite or something. Because that's why it's good to get an early start. Right. And uh, you can't really hurt the machine by touching it. And that's something I think that most people have to overcome. Yeah. Uh, you may kill the program. You may make the program do something you hadn't expected it to do, like what we did here. Uh, but you cannot hurt the machine from the front panel. And, uh, and the excellent thing is you've got an, a second chance to go back and right. fix or correct the, the same program. So it's not, a, you know, you have to do it one time, that's it, it's your only chance. You can just keep working and working with it. The computer's going to sit there all day. Never gets tired? Never gets, Never tired. gets it, tired. It draws as much electricity as, <clears throat> say, there used to be uh, computers with 40,000 vacuum tubes. And today, a computer just as powerful draws something around the level of an electric light bulb. Gentlemen, the future is wide open. Computers are going to be a part of it. And with help such as this, we can all be a part of it, too. Thank you very much for being with us on For Your Information. And if you're at B. Dalton's, where? At South Square? At Northgate. At Northgate, Saturday uh, the 11th. Right. There's going to be a signing party for your new book. We're all looking forward to it. Play some computer music. And thanks for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. Fred Dignazio has been our guest on For Your Information. Join us again next week for another in-depth interview with a prominent guest. For Your Information is a presentation of the News Department of WTVD.